All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you know, we get this accusation often from Muslims that the Apostle Paul corrupted the gospel. We kind of hear the same message for different reasons from atheists that Paul taught something different than what had come before him. We're going to be investigating those claims today, seeing whether they hold up to scrutiny when we look at the hard data. You know, it's one thing to make this claim. It's another to provide data to back it. So we're going to look at the data today. Uh, let me open us with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow believers and unbelievers around the world. We ask that anyone watching today, whether they are a Christian or not, approach the material with an open mind. They, they not simply dismiss what they hear today uh, to fit with their preconceived notions, but actually look at the data and see if the data supports their beliefs. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion and give us the words to say. We ask that anything that we say that is useful is applied to people's lives and anything that we say that is untrue is simply forgotten and not used. We ask all this in Jesus name, amen. Amen. Alrighty. So as I said, we're gonna be talking about the Apostle Paul. I'll give my guests a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, first up is Lloyd. His channel is approaching 1,000, so be sure to head over there and help him get to that port and milestone. A link is in the video description box. All right. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, and thank you again, uh, Thaddeus, for having me on the channel for all support and IO. Of course, for your presence, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, as you know, I mostly do anti-Islamic polemics. I talk about the Sharia, the Islamic law, or the, the Muslim Talmud, as I've been calling it. However, today, um, I've been spending some time working on this presentation on Paul, which um, I was graciously offered to present for us today. So I will be doing commentary rather than delivery. And yeah, this has been a lot of work, but I think this is rather than just doing the anti-Christian polemics, it's time we started to defend our faith and defend the Bible and to push back against the lies and the deceptions. So yeah, so this is our first effort and I hope we will do many more like this to inspire others get these facts out and allow people to refute the dishonesty. Excellent. Uh, next up is Io from the Third Apology. Awesome. Yeah. Um, very excited to be here. I was supposed to be there for the scheduled one, but I was having some uh, just laptop trouble. So that kind of sucked, but I'm glad to be back now. Um, I'm extremely grateful for uh, you know, Lloyd and Thaddeus offering uh, to give me an opportunity to present today. And as Lloyd said, you know, it's important to be able to um, to expose the faulty foundation of Islam, but it's also important that we make sure we supplement it with, you know, what we see as the truth. And so, um, as Thaddeus said in the prayer, you know, please just consider it with an open mind. And uh, I just pray that um, everyone is able to take something of value um, today. Excellent. And of course, I'm Thaddeus. Most of everyone watching will hopefully already know who I am. Um, I, my, my, you know, my passion is really Christian apologetics. So I'm very excited about today's topic. You know, I got into talking about Islam because I saw the need, not necessarily because, you know, I was super fascinated <laughs> with, with, with Islam. Um, you know, I, I, I'm growing to, to love talking about Islam, but, you know, my, my true passion is talking about Christianity. Uh, one quick announcement. Yeah. I'll have a new scripted video out tomorrow morning looking at the religious statistics in Iran. Uh, a recent survey suggests that roughly half the country has left Islam and no longer identifies as any kind of Muslim. So, you know, it's uh, some fascinating data. There's a lot of other interesting things in that survey. And I also look at what it means for Christianity. So look for that out tomorrow morning uh, in Eastern time, or, you know, say tomorrow evening, if you're in Asia. All right, so we'll go ahead and dive in the presentation. We're going to be answering uh, kind of two questions. One uh, primary question we'll be answering is, you know, did Paul teach the same message as Jesus and the other disciples? And then secondarily, we're going to be looking at whether early Muslims believed that Paul taught a different message. Awesome. So I can go ahead and share my screen. Oh, yep. Hold on. Okay. I forgot to enable that. I have to enable it every time. And yeah forget half the time. 
All right, you should be able to share now. Awesome. Okay. All righty. So we'll go ahead and kick this thing off. And and by the way, guys, yeah, by by all means, you know, don't hesitate to interrupt if you have any comments or um, Daddy, you know, if you see any uh, if you see any comments in the chat as well, that'll be great. Definitely want to acknowledge those. But um, yeah, as Thaddeus himself said, I, I, I too have a very strong passion for apologetics and, you know, I'm getting there with Islam. So when when Lloyd, you know, gave me the offer to present on this topic, I, I immediately knew I wanted to jump on it just because um, although it's a great topic that you can use to appeal to Muslims, it's also something that you'll hear from contemporary atheists as well. And so this is something that has kind of the best of both worlds. And so regardless of your background, hopefully there's something of value that you can take from this. And so before we can answer the question whether or not Christianity was invented by Paul or uh, whether he corrupted the, the uh, Islamic true message of Jesus before um, things later down the line, first we have to answer the question of who Paul is. And so in this preamble here, we see that Paul is, he's referred to as Paul the, the apostle, a contemporary of Jesus. Some refer to him as St. Paul or Saul of Tarsus. Saul would be his, his Jewish name um, because as we know about Paul, he was a Pharisee. Um, he had his own reputation, his own background long before um, his conversion happened and long before Christ came on the scene with him. Um, and then also we have Paul, obviously his Greek name. <laughs> There's a bit of a side comment here about, uh, you know, Muslims will say that nobody in the Holy Land, you know, spoke Greek and, you know, it, it was all Islamic, but obviously we see that that's not the case just by looking at his name. Um, so looking at his life, he was born in, or born, born between five to six AD in Tarsus of Turkey, obviously. And then obviously died between some time of 64 to 67 AD in Rome by um, beheading or, or martyrdom. And so, oh, okay, cool, scrolling. All righty, so looking at Acts 13.9 here, it says that um, Saul, who was also called Paul, so we see how he kind of has the names referred to him interchangeably throughout the text. Um, but nevertheless, we see that he had a kind of back and forth, I don't want to say identity, but definitely, you know, his toes in the water between his, his Greek and his Jewish kind of identity. So knowing that, we have to then ask ourselves the question of what sets Paul apart? We have the disciples, we have all these other figures, these church fathers, etc. But what makes Paul so special? What makes him the one that these Muslims, these atheists want to point their finger at um, to then accuse him of saying, or to then accuse him of corrupting the original message of Jesus? And so looking at Paul, we can see that he was the foremost leader of the Christian movement beyond the confines of the Holy Land. Um, he's one of only two Pharisees whose, whose writings have survived, which in and of itself is, is amazing. And obviously, we know that Paul also wrote the largest portion of the Bible in the shortest period of time. You know, as we see in more detail here, he wrote the New Testament over a period of only 17 years, which when you think about just, I mean, it's it, it's widespread accessibility and just how in-depth the texts really go and how it was just spread all over the region. 17 years really is not that long of a time. And especially looking at the fact that he wrote certain uh, a specific of these letters between a period of only two to three years in prison, you know, such as Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, etc. And then obviously we see that regarding Paul, he was not an apostle that was commissioned by a congregation. He wasn't sent out by some group who told him he was assigned to Rome or assigned to, uh, you know, Antioch or whatever. But instead we see that he was given the revelation and the commission by none other than Jesus himself. And so we have the, the various sources here um, regarding this as well. So whether it's Philippians 2.25, 2 Corinthians 8.23, um, it's all there to, sh to clearly show that Paul's own, Paul, Paul's mission was, was his own. He wasn't, he wasn't commissioned by some larger organization. And so knowing all of that, how does Paul refer to himself? And one of the most famous chapters in which we can see this is going to be in Galatians chapter one. And so if we just go through this really quickly, Paul of himself writes, Paul an apostle, not from human beings, nor through a human, but being through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from the present evil age which the, uh, with the will of God with the will of our God and Father, to, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And so just looking at that first opening, you can already see how Paul uh, 
extends or communicates his adherence to the gospel, his loyalty to the gospel. Because even as he goes on in verse six through nine, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly forsaking the one who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Not that there is another, but there are some who are disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. So here he is calling out the very things that the scholars and the Muslims are attempting to accuse him of doing, which is pretty contradictory. And then in verse eight, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. So often you hear Muslims talk about Muhammad in the Bible, and although there's no direct references, if, if you want something that's about as close to it as you can get, there you go. But uh, in verse nine, he continues and he says, and, and we have said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one that you received, let that one be accursed. And so this is why we see that the Muslims have to go after Paul, because they know the message that he preaches, and they see what he says here about anyone preaching anything else. The Muslims know that their message is obviously different. And so in order to preserve their message, they have to try and discredit Paul. So do you guys have any thoughts about that so far or anything you want to jump in with or add or comments? Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll throw in a, a couple comments. You know, um, according to many perspectives, the letters of Paul are the earliest writings of mm -hmm. the New Testament. Uh, they're either slightly earlier than the other writings or roughly contemporary with them. So we, you know, you, there's not a lot of opportunity here for, for, for something to have been corrupted by Paul uh, to change what the gospels are saying, because you know, they're kind of written at the, the same time. And you know, we have a number of letters in the, the New Testament written by people other than Paul. None of them oppose Paul in any way. You know, there's no indication in any of the historical record that anyone in the early church opposed Paul. And, Certainly, if he was, you know, drastically changing the message, we would expect that. And indeed, in uh, the letter, one of Peter's letters, he writes that, uh, you know, some of the, the stuff Paul writes is, is hard to understand, just like the other scriptures. Uh, and he's kind of, you know, already elevating the writings of Paul to the level of scripture. Uh, so to argue that he was completely changing things, there's just there's just nothing to support that. It, it has to be, a, you know, a, a matter of blind faith because there is no data to support that. And there's lots of data to support that what Paul was teaching, it was the same thing as what everyone else was. Yeah, right. yeah we'll be presenting that evidence about the, the how Paul and the other gospels overlap or Paul's epistle. But also when he says, if anyone preaches to your gospel other than that you received, Paul's not saying what I told you. He's saying, what you already know of Jesus' teaching. Yes. And yeah. he's also saying here that there are people out there in the church attempting to corrupt the scriptures. He's already warning of people preaching false gospels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thaddeus, and, and you guys both nailed it. And, and especially going off of what Thaddeus said, I mean, he already, there, there's already this foundation that's been laid because, I mean, just looking at Galatians 1, I mean, he even says here at the top, uh, to the churches of Galatia, right here in verse two, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. It's not, it doesn't say synagogue, right? And so who is he writing to? How could he invent something that already existed on the scene before he came right. along? Um, but it's just a classic case of reading into the text or not seeing what you already want to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll, as Lloyd said, we'll go through the evidence which shows how the gospels and what Paul says overlap. And we'll also show some uh, Islamic sources, which, which show Paul's authority and show how he's, re uh, he's revered by some of the scholars. And so it's a bit of a variant of the original Islamic dilemma, but I think it's just as hard hitting nonetheless. So let's keep going here. So let's see what Paul says here about the gospel itself. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And then as we know here, the Gentiles were pagans. They weren't Jewish or Christian. Um, so when we look at Galatians, which was, as, as he said, as Thaddeus said very early on, written about 49 AD, Paul himself says that you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. I was advancing beyond many Jews. And, you know, he had that stature. He had that position. And yet, despite that, Judaism is in the past for Paul. It's, it's no longer something that he's pursuing or advancing in because he now believes that in Christ or in the body of Christ, he's become this separate entity from Judaism. He's now 
I, I guess you could say, progress beyond the law, beyond the law and the prophets, not to throw it out, but to simply go in the direction that they were already pointing it. Right. And so and here also, in verse, Paul, Paul, was ahead, in yeah. Paul was in position to become the next high priest, so he had a lot to gain if he stayed. Yeah. yeah. And so when we look at specifically later down the line, you know, some of the things Paul went through, it's kind of like a similar case with the resurrection. You know, the disciples just going through some of the worst persecution imaginable um, wouldn't be likely if they knew it was a lie. And it's the same thing here with Paul. Obviously, he didn't experience the risen Christ at the same time that the disciples did. But shortly after he did, and he still went through, I mean, the intense persecution, despite having, I mean, the world in the palm of his hand, so to speak. And so it's a very important point, Lloyd. Um, it's here. Oh, yeah. So right here in verse 22 up top, he says, I was unknown personally to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. So again, the churches are already there. There's already that foundation established. And even then, it says that they only kept hearing that the one who once was persecuting us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Because when Paul met the risen Lord, he was on his way to Damascus to round up Christians and to bring them back and to throw them in prison. But obviously there was a change. Go ahead. Yeah. If he's, a, if he's going to round up Christians, how did he invent a religion that already exists? I'm saying, it doesn't make any, it, and, you know, I, I feel like we could just stop the presentation right here almost and just be like, okay, case closed, but, you know, we'll still go through and see some of these ridiculous claims, but it's so spot on. Yeah, it's so spot on. And as you said, when we were talking about this, Lloyd, you know, they recognize that he was the one persecuting them. And so if, you know, if, if you're someone who knows what Paul had been doing, murdering Christians, throwing them in prison, the last thing you're going to want to do is just put your guard down and welcome him with open arms. Now, eventually they did, right? But if he were there to corrupt and to invent his new way of thinking about Jesus, you know, and, and worshiping Jesus, when in reality, Jesus was a Muslim, the, the, these early Christians or these, whoever they were, whatever you want to call them, they would have, they would have caught that because Paul to them was someone who wanted to kill them. They wouldn't have just let their guards down and let whatever he wanted to propagate in the church pass. And so again, that affirms how, He's not just going around making these things up for his own benefit. And so, yeah, simple overview. He had a separation for, for, so Paul had a separation from Judaism, which was the case during his lifetime in ministry. But not only that, not only was he separate, but he was a catalyst to lead the Jesus movement out of Judaism to become its own religious group. And that isn't to say that he invented Christianity, but it's more that he was, I guess you could say his midwife meaning that he was, he was responsible for the large number of Gentiles entering the sectarian group, not on the basis of becoming Jews first and, fa and, and falling in line under that sect, but to, again, kind of blaze your own trail and simply seek after Christ. And so when we think about that, we have to ask ourselves, okay, well, how did the life of Jesus compare with the life of Paul? And when looking at the life of Jesus, we can clearly see that he led a mostly rural Jewish uh, life within the Holy Land. He, he, he didn't travel, you know, more than a few hundred miles outside of where he was born. Um, and so, although he absolutely laid the foundation, it was Paul who definitely took the message abroad and applied it to these um, different cultural contexts. And so this is a great graphic here that we have, you know, you can see the different places um, and how they relate to the events of Jesus's life. So, for example, here uh, in Nazareth, you know, Jesus's hometown, uh, Jesus's hometown, this is where he was rejected by his townspeople. Um, up here in Caesarea Philippi, Peter says that Jesus is the Messiah. And I've been to these places as well. And so it's really cool to see, you know, how so many crazy things happened in such an immediate area. But when we contrast that with the life of Paul, I mean, I mean, look at this here, right? So this is where Jesus was right down here. Well, actually, no, you can go down even lower. What am I saying? Jesus's area of ministry right here. The blue so dot Paul, basically is Jesus's ministry. One more time. The blue dot next to Jerusalem, that's roughly Jesus's ministry. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a thumbtack compared to what Paul did, right? And so Paul was here. He was getting ready to go over here to round up Christians, and this is where he encountered the risen Lord. And after that, everything changed. So you see him go all the way up through Syria, Turkey, up through Istanbul here, Bulgaria. And he probably, you know, you know we know he messed around down here as well in, in Athens, you know, with Acts 17 and things like that. Hmm. Then he goes all the way up through here, finally down to Rome. And there are some, there, there are some people saying, you know, he, he had intentions to go all the way to Spain even, but even just looking at the chart here, you can clearly see the different contrast um, that Paul's ministry extended to outside of Christ. Now, obviously Christ laid that foundation, but without, without, um, you know, 
Paul going to, I mean, essentially at the time, the ends of the earth and spreading this message. I mean, who knows where Christianity would have ended up. And so knowing these places that he went to and knowing the different environment, I mean, just look at these places, think about each different culture, just in some of these regions, regions within each country. And think about now trying to take the message of the gospel and bring it to these different contexts and these different cultures. It's no wonder that Paul had to write these letters and had to write these messages to these churches, not to give the gospel, they already had the gospels, but the message for them was how they could apply the teachings of Christ, how they could apply these principles of Christian thought to their different cultural contexts in these churches. And so Paul, right. as we said in the beginning, was definitely more of that midwife. He was more of that kind of uh, just, just mediator who really kind of helped alleviate tension within churches and disagreements over how rules and things should be applied. Any comments there, guys, or any, anything? Yeah, I got a, a couple of comments from the, the chat. Uh, End Time 2016 said Paul went to first century Jews and his message was confirmed by them. Muhammad went to seventh century Jews and was mocked by them. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, someone uh, much earlier said that uh, Adawa team was recently doing a show on Paul trying to question whether he was historically reliable. And I just wanted to point that out because, you know, that's why we're, we're talking about this. Everyone, whether they're, they're um, Muslims or internet atheists, you know, maybe not like professional scholars, but every, everyone who is, you know, just out there trying to come up with their own idea about how Christianity founded, they always go to Paul. So, you know, that's why we're talking about the subject. You know, Christians aren't generally confused about whether Paul is teaching the same message or not. But people outside the, the faith, not knowing really any of the actual data, just look at Paul and say, well, he, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, so he must be the one that changed the message. Yeah, it's sad. All righty. Well, yeah. So and, and, and like I said, we'll, we'll give some spotlight to these Internet atheists and to these Muslims as well. So don't worry, that's coming. Um, <laughs> And so, as and you actually just said that perfectly well, as we have here in the bullet point. So the common argument against Paul is that Jesus taught a pure ethical form of Judaism that focused on God and gracious living. That's what the atheists will say. The Muslims will say that Jesus was a full on Muslim, but both will agree, the Muslims and the atheists will agree that Paul developed a new religion that worshiped Jesus rather than God. And so how do they, how do they attest to this? You know, so we see how in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, not of himself really. But whereas the fourth gospel, John, Jesus talks about himself all the time. And so we have different views kind of um, circulating from, for example, Clement of Alexandria, that John was a spiritual gospel um, in which it didn't tell the literal history of Jesus's career, but it's more of a spiritual and theological significance. Yeah. On this point, if, if they apply the same logic that Paul didn't speak about Jesus constantly, because obviously he was speaking to people who knew the gospels and knew Jesus, then in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus doesn't speak of himself. He speaks of the kingdom of God. So by their logic, logic, didn't Jesus know about Jesus? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's ridiculous. And, and that's so true, as we said. He's not going to, because we, we, kind of, we kind of approach the text almost with this arrogance from our 21st century mindset where we think, we, we kind of subconsciously think, you know, didn't Paul know that scholars centuries down the line would want to analyze his letters? So did, shouldn't he have told them, you know, things that we could know were referencing us and things like that? But it's like, no. He's within his context of his life and his ministry. And in that context, it's just him and the church. He's not worried about scholars centuries down the line who, who can't figure him out, so to speak, even though it's not hard to figure out. And so he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't have to say, okay, by the way, I'm going to reference the gospels a lot, just in case some scholars that are down the line want to make sure that I'm not corrupting the message. No, he's talking to a group that already knows they know the gospel. He knows the gospel. And so the, the understanding is mutual and there doesn't need to be a need to, um, really flesh that out in the way that these scholars are demanding. So great point, Lloyd. Um, and as we said, you know, he was already on his way to persecute the Christians when he was converted. So how did he invent them? And then as we see, Paul's revelation came within only three years of Jesus's death. And yet the, there were already communities of Jesus's followers that were spreading beyond Judea, Galilee, Samaria, to Syria and other parts of the ancient Mediterranean world as well. And so just looking at it from a basic chronological perspective, there's really nothing there to say that Paul was inventing something that had not existed yet. And so finally, we come to the letter uh, to Rome that Paul wrote. 
And this is the only surviving letter that addresses a church that he never visited. And again, despite this, we see an influential church that Paul had no role in founding. And he writes about visiting to Rome, building a relationship with them and the churches there and to gain support for mission to Spain. So, so there we go. Um, Paul relied on these churches located in major cosmopolitan cities to support his mission. And all of these churches existed prior to independent of his mission. And despite this, they still supported him. So again, if he were just this outlier trying, well, he was an outlier, but if he were an outlier trying to come on the scene to disrupt the teaching or you know, promote false teachings or start his own thing, this would have been caught immediately by these churches who were already influential, already had their position basically solidified within the Mediterranean world and could have spotted what he was trying to do from a mile away. Next, we see that, or we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear them often say how, you know, well, Paul didn't even really write about Jesus. So that shows that he's kind of stepping away from what Christ was saying in the gospels and trying to blaze his own trail and, and, and begin this new thing. But again, people know that just, be, yeah, yes, Paul rarely quotes Jesus or appeals to the stories from Jesus's life. And apart from, you know, what we know about the crucifixion, the resurrection, the only explicit teaching that Paul refers to is concerning divorce and the Lord's suffer, uh, Supper. But despite this, he still insists that his teaching is consistent with that of Peter and the other apostles. And so even though Paul rarely mentions specific examples from Jesus's sayings and ministries, his values strongly reflect Jesus's influence. Because as we said, it's not about re-explaining everything that they already had in the previous letters. It's about merely explaining how they can be applied. And that comes with an assumption that you already know the gospels and you already know the foundation. Now the question is, how are we going to build? And so even just looking at a few ways as to how, uh, you know, Jesus and Paul were similar, even though he didn't cite explicit teachings in mass, um, we see that Jesus taught his followers to lead. And so did Paul. So we see in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, uh, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord and ourselves, uh, your servants for Jesus to say. So he, so he taught them to lead by serving. Again, Jesus promoted love as the greatest virtue. And so did Paul. And so in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, we see that Paul says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And then a few more here, Jesus, now, Jesus announced the coming kingdom of God. And Paul taught that the kingdom of God uh, would fully manifest upon the risen Jesus is Lord, uh, the risen Jesus is return in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Jesus also involved in outreach to sinners, prostitutes, lepers, etc. And Paul ex extended the good news to these same type of people, to the Gentiles. And so as we see, there's a different sense to the Gospels compared to Paul's letters. But despite this, we can, we can see the clear, uh, similar lines of thinking, the clear application. And so to say that, you know, Paul forged his own path and tried to start something different really is just not warranted. Any comments, guys? Or Yeah, I wanted to bring up something. You, you know, you mentioned that... Um... Paul quotes Jesus's teaching on the Lord's Supper. And of course, he does that for a specific reason in the book of Corinthians, mm -hmm. because the, the Corinthian church had some wrong ideas about it. Uh, if, if they hadn't been doing these practices where they were kind of excluding the poor people from the, the, the meal because, you know, they didn't have anything to provide, then he would have never written about it. And we'd say, well, I guess Paul didn't know anything about the, the uh, Lord's Supper. So it just kind of shows how silly this kind of argument from silence is. Well, Paul didn't say something in his, you know, 30 or 40 pages of written text that we have surviving to the, the current day. So he obviously knew nothing about it. Uh, you know, argument from silence is always questionable. But when it, you're talking about something that uh, not being mentioned in letters that were written at specific times for specific purposes, not to get a complete overview of his entire doctrine, then it's especially silly to say, well, he didn't know that, uh, you know, Jesus healed the, the sick because he doesn't mention that or, or whatever particular thing you want to point to. It's so true. That's a great point. Lloyd, anything you want to say or? I uh, know I'll leave it for later, but no, I, I think you, you, you're doing a great job. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, what you're saying, you, you, I think you're hitting all the right notes here. Awesome. By the uh, way, before, I just, Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, before you move on, there was a, a comment that Vilnius just made. He pointed out that Paul quotes creeds written within a few years of the crucifixion. Uh, and 
I don't recall whether this is in the presentation or not, but that's definitely a good point because there's a number of passages in his letters where because of the you know the the technical details of the of the grammar and such that um, professional scholars nearly universally agree that these are pre Pauline hymns that they were songs sung by Christians, and you know they have the some of the highest doctrine in all of Paul's letters comes from these uh, pre Pauline yeah. hymns. So we can yeah. see that the Christians um, even before Paul wrote his first letter were teaching the same message. Yeah, um, there's a comment above that Stephen and Angel says if we attribute Hebrews to Paul, then there is a significant amount of testimony of Paul preaching Jesus' message. Mm -hmm. So, something so to think true. about. By the way, I just realized I had a, I was using my laptop mic, not my Yeti mic here. So I'm just going to switch the uh, input real quick. Uh, Chloe just said, we have more evidence that Paul did not awesome. corrupt. Can you guys hear me? Yep. 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 Still hear you. Uh, which, which is a great point. You know, if Muslims or whoever is going to make this positive claim that Paul corrupted the gospel, they need evidence. And not only do they not have evidence, we have evidence against it. So we're in a very much stronger position. Oh, we, we can't hear you anymore. <laughs> When you asked, when you asked, can you hear me? We, I, I heard you just fine, but now you're not coming through. No, your mic switched off or something. It chose no mic. Yeah, sometimes in Zoom you have to re-enable the mic. Yeah, you, you have to go in and actually select the mic from the the list, even though it's set to the same as the system. For some reason, it doesn't come through sometimes. And now, now you're on mute, so. Now we can't tell even if it was working. Shall I just continue in the meantime? I'll just switch it back. I don't. I don't even want to have okay. to do that. Back. <laughs> Hold up. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I'll just switch. I don't even want to mess with that right now. Alrighty. So yeah. Uh, let's let's like I said. Let's just go ahead and take a closer look at these polemical claims against Paul. And so this is where we're going to zero in on the Muslims because, as we see here, the Muslims and their willing parents will claim that Paul was the originator or, of Christianity. They'll claim that he corrupted the religion of Jesus. Uh, they say that Jesus was a Muslim practicing Islam according to Muslims. And so they'll have a rallying cry of "Back to Jesus." And on the flip side, they'll say "Away with Paul." You'll, all, you'll also see this, by the way, just as a side note regarding um, the, the confirmation of the, the people of the book within uh, Islam, because what they'll say is, oh, you know, this is referring to some original message, like the gospel of Jesus that we don't have access to anymore, as if there was some original message that uh, yep. Jesus spoke where he preached Islam and therefore now it's corrupted. But well, again, don't forget, they claim that Jesus brought a book like Muhammad did, the Injil. So mm -hmm. This mythical book that they have no evidence for whatsoever. It's, yeah, they're grasping at straws. And so we see this explicitly within the Jesus Seminar. These scholars of the Jesus Seminar do not believe in the deity of Christ. They deny the resurrection. They deny the miracles of Christ, deny the substitutionary atonement death. They deny that the Holy Spirit is the author of scripture. And they deny it moves the minds and the hands of all the writers. And again, even just looking at 2 Timothy 3.16, we can throw already one of those out the window. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And then same thing in 2 Peter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see that Nicene or Chalcedonian Christianity did not exist in the first century, nor did Catholicism or Protestantism, none of that. The earliest followers of Jesus were Jews. They were coming out of Judaism and uh, subscribing to the message that Paul spoke and the rest of the disciples. And that also, again, attests to the truth of Christianity because these people had no incentive to want to just be persecuted by the Jewish authorities of the time. And yet they did because they were genuinely convinced it was true. Um, the earliest followers of Jesus did not see themselves creating a new religion. They were Messianic Jews. They were sectarian Jewish followers of Jesus. And they were following what they saw as the prophesied Jewish Messiah. And so the Jesus movement that we see now today became a separate entity from early Judaism through a process that involved growth 
evangelization, conversion by many Gentiles, and a Christ-centric rather than Torah-centric focus. And then we also see that, as I said, they faced persecution. And so they were, they were uh, expelled from various synagogues in the empire. And that's the thing, you know, the persecution, whereas one would have thought would have, uh, you know, struck it down or uh, destroyed Christianity or wiped it off the map, it actually helped to spread it because as they were kicked out of one region, they simply went to the next proclaiming the same thing. And so by that process, more people heard the truth. We see the conversion by many Gentiles uh, because they're preaching a Christ-centric rather than Torah-centric focus. And this all happened through that growth and evangelization. So through those five principles, we can see how, I mean, obviously God had a hand in the process, but if it weren't for those five, Christianity would, would be nowhere near the level that it's at today. And this process, as amazing as it is, was already occurring during the lifetime and ministry of Paul. And the growth of Christianity completely changed the, the balance of power dynamic in the movement everywhere in the empire, except in the Holy Land, because, I mean, the Jews pretty much had, I mean, that's, that's, that's their land. And there wasn't really going to be much of a transformation there on a large scale. And so in 1 Corinthians 9, we can see how Paul says he became a Jew to the Jew and a Gentile to the Gentile in order that by all means he might win some to Christ. And right off the bat, your average Muslim is going to jump at that and say that, okay, see, there you go. So Paul is lying to different groups to basically try to promote his own idea of a religion or his own idea of who he sees Jesus as. If he's talking to the Jews, he's going to tell them one lie to get them to jump aboard. If he's talking to the Gentiles, he'll do the same thing. And obviously that's not what the passage is talking about. And even with a careful analysis, you can see that the average Muslim is, is guilty of Use, utilizing the, the same strategy that Paul does here. When 1 Corinthians 9 says that Paul became a Jew to the Jew and a Gentile to the Gentile, it doesn't mean that to one group he's speaking the truth and to another that he's not. What it simply means is that his approach in speaking the same truth, which to him was Christ, is different. But in that approach, his end goal is to ultimately always bring them back to Christ. So if he's talking to a group of Jews, well, actually, let me start with the Gentiles. In Acts, in, in Acts 17 or around those chapters, when Paul goes to Mars Hill and he talks with the Athenian philosophers, he doesn't quote from the Torah or Moses and the prophets or any of these things. He quotes from some of their own Athenian poets, not to, ver not to um, say that the Athenian poets are inspired or that uh, they carry the same authority as the scriptures do, but to simply make a point that will then bring them back to the truth of Christ. And then obviously, on the other end of that spectrum, when he talks to the Jews, he's not going to be citing some contemporary Greek, you know, philosophers or poets. He cites the law. He cites the Torah. He cites the things that he knows they're going to be familiar with. But at the end of the day, regardless of how he starts, his goal is to always finish the same. And so, you know, all of us are, are guilty of doing that on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, even the Muslim is. You know, I was talking to Lloyd about this, and I said how, you know, when, when, when a Muslim is trying to convert a Christian... They're not going to talk about the beginning of Islam and, and uh, you know, Arabia and all these things. What are they going to say when they know they're trying to convince a Christian? Oh, well, we believe in Jesus just like you do. You know, we revere Jesus. And they want to try to get them from that position. Whereas if they're talking to, let's say, I don't know, like a, a Hindu or something, someone like a Hindu in the Middle East, right? Maybe they're going to talk more about their region and how, you know, uh, Muhammad came from that area as the last of the prophets to speak truth from Allah or something like that, right? And so at the end of the day, his goal is still to convince both parties of Islam, but how he does that is going to be different. And so the Muslim's guilty of this, just as Paul is. But the truth is that it's not bad. It's not bad how you do it. What matters is, is it true? And so it's a non-issue that they try to convince, uh, uh, accuse Paul with here. Any comments there, guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree completely. This is just kind of common sense. You you don't reach someone by talking about things they don't care about. You reach yeah. them by talking about things they care about. You know, if yeah. you say you're you have a friend who's really into to sports, uh, but doesn't care at all about say the fine arts, you don't you don't go to them and tell them all about the how all these paintings demonstrate the love of God. I mean, that mm -hmm. that wouldn't make any sense. Well, you could talk about you know, how, how the teamwork aspects and, and working together, how this is similar to Christianity or something. And, and that's all Paul's saying that, you know, he follows the customs uh, of the Gentiles when he's talking to Gentiles, he doesn't force them to follow Jewish customs. 
likewise, when he's talking to Jews, he follows the, the Jewish customs and he doesn't, you know, make them uncomfortable by bringing up a bunch of issues that only matter to pagans. But mm-hmm. he's teaching the same message in both cases. Right. He's just changing, uh, you know, how he approaches the subject, like he said. Well, there is the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? And the Jews knew he was no longer a practicing Jew. So who is he lying to? Mm -hmm. They knew it. So it's not like he's deceiving them. They knew, they all knew. So he's coming to them, practicing their customs, but he's no longer following their beliefs. And he's talking to them about Christianity. Yeah. So so I don't see how they can sway that, turn that into some form of deceit. The Kia. The Kia is a doctrine that, I mean, Lying in Islam is a doctrine. There, there's there's whole pages written about how to do it. Whereas this is just one small verse relating to him just when in Rome. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we're, 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 we're a pretty decent deal into the presentation now. And, you know, I can already just say, I mean, notice how these arguments are, are honestly just grasping at straws. I mean, this is really sad. And, you know, we haven't even really gotten into the meat yet, but just the arguments that are being raised are so easy to see through, you know, and I don't say that to say that we're so great or, you know, we have it all figured out, but you know, what does that say when the best of the best really are just these non-issues that when examined critically, you can see that even the Muslims would be guilty of doing as well. And so, I mean, this is just, it's really not off to a good start. I doubt it'll be off to a good finish either, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's good for us to go through this for, for, for the audience. So now we have to answer the essential question. And this essential question is something that could be attributed to how Paul definitely blazed his own trail regarding um, the spread of the message. And that question is, must one become a Jew to be a follower of Jesus? And to that, Paul said to the effect of no, he said firmly no. Um, And this was a common issue that we see in many of his letters, because many of the uh, controversies that were going on within these churches were between the Jewish conservatives who had been converted to Christianity uh, in comparison to the pagan Greeks who had been converted. And so even though they were both Christians, they had different backgrounds. And the Jewish conservatives would say that even though you're a Christian, you still had to adhere to, to the traditions, circumcision, all of the, you know, the feasts, etc. Whereas the Greek pagans, having no background with that, saw little to no value in doing such if the message really was about Christ as, as they had heard. So for example, uh, we see how James and other members of the Jerusalem community believe that Jewish Christians were obligated to keep the law if for no, if for no other reason than to be a good witness to their fellow Jews and thereby win some of them to Christ. But Paul understood this, the implications of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, which meant that requiring circumcision and law observance of the Jewish Christians, but not the Gentile ones, uh, by doing that, you were creating two different Christian groups two different ways of following Jesus. And this is an important point because, uh, I mean, you think about it from the perspective of the Jewish Christians. I mean, you're coming from a lifestyle and a worldview with millennia of history behind and millennia of traditions. And although you believe the message of Christ, for you to simply just, you know, 180 from that is a hard thing. Whereas with the the pagan Greeks, they didn't have that foundation to begin with. So for them, it wasn't as big of a deal. It wasn't really a deal at all. But because of their different backgrounds, we can see how that conflict came into play. And so when answering this question, you know, Paul wanted that united Christian community. And he recognized that he recognized that uh, by trying to keep that mosaic law, you're not putting yourself under that law. And that's a law that you cannot fulfill. And he wanted that freedom through Christ. He wanted to embrace that because he truly believed it was true. And so he, in direct, I don't want to say opposition, but just in direct contrast to the Jewish conservatives, made it clear that you can obviously adhere to the traditions and the, uh, you know, whatever you want for the sake of, for the sake of the traditions, but to treat them as if they're going to make you more holy or righteous or saved is just a farce because that only comes through Christ. And Paul understood, Paul understood that Jesus set us free and that a new covenant had taken its place. Excellent. Uh, I did want to make one comment there that even this idea that, you know, there was certain members under James that were were teaching a different message. Even that doesn't really have much data behind it. You know, Mm -hmm. it it occurs in Acts where a, a party 
it says a party from James came to the same place where Peter was. And then Peter started acting differently. <laughs> it's not even explicit that, you know, they were telling Peter to act differently. He just started acting like, you know, he wanted to be one of the, one of the, that, that crew again, you know, part of that yeah. Jewish community. And, uh, you know, James was the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So saying a party from James is just kind of like saying a group of people from Jerusalem. So, you know, one, that, one, they're not explicitly teaching a different message there. And two, even if they were, it doesn't necessarily include James himself. So, and, th and this is the best you, you can do to say that there was two different <laughs> messages that, you know, this is the best passage. And, um, and of course the, the council of Jerusalem, which is, it occurs directly after this two passages in acts are like the only two times we really see this uh, conflict. And, in both cases, everyone comes to agreement that it's not necessary for the Gentile converts to accept the Jewish traditions, but it's also okay for the Jewish people to keep following them. They, they don't have to stop doing their traditions that they love. Uh, yeah. So oh, I was just going to say, so that, you know, there's really very little data that there was some kind of massive disagreement going on here. Uh, there was probably some, some disagreement, certainly, but Mm -hmm. akin to what we would see in the modern church where some christians say that uh say say take baptism for example some say that you have to make an active commitment to, to christ before you can be baptized I, you have to be a, you know a teenager or preteen type age before you can make that conscious decision for yourself and others say well you can baptize babies but they still have to accept christ later on uh, you know it's just kind of a, a it's a disagreement certainly but it's not the kind of thing that the church would it was be, going to be torn apart by or two different messages that have nothing to do with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and like I said, and this is the, the best you can get as far as a disagreement. So there's nothing at all to support the Muslim it's idea. Sad. It's sad. There was this non, non, non divine Jesus that people were following. And the, you know, this Muslim Jesus who taught uh, Allah and all nonsense. It's a fantasy Thaddeus. It's a fantasy. Also, briefly, with James and the other members, they felt they wanted to maintain tradition, right, for the sake of tradition and for connection with their, with their family, who were still Jews. Now, by that token, that means that they were also being a Jew to the Jew, which means that, according to the Muslim and, and atheist logic, they oh. are also practicing deception. So there was never any true yeah, religion, I guess, to you. All of them under the bus, not just Oh, my all. goodness. Yeah. So now we're just searching for something that we can't even find. Anyways... Yeah, great points, guys. And so, yeah, you know, Paul Paul said that the righteousness comes not by the law, but, you know, through faith in Christ. And so here's the real crux of the matter regarding, for example, take circumcision. Circumcision was a genuine issue for the uncircumcised Gentiles because on, under Roman rule, it was potentially dangerous to be seen as a Jew if, if you weren't already. They were under the persecution and would-be Christians had to be Jewish because there was no separate Christian religion. The, the Roman Empire just saw them all as one, and either way, they wanted them under their feet. And so this dilemma tore Judaism and Christianity apart from each other, and it took more than a century after Paul's death for this process to, what does that mean, to become a fait accompli? That's like some Latin term, huh? A fait accompli. It just means that it was, um, it was the deed was done, and there was no change, mm -hmm. no going back. Yeah, okay. settled matter. Yeah. And so this dilemma was unresolvable because Paul could not let it go. He wanted one Christian community. Followers could still consider themselves Jewish and observe Jewish law for the sake of tradition, but it should not be seen as a path of salvation because to Paul, salvation was in Christ. And I think you could definitely say that, at least within the Jewish context, that's where you saw a lot of that rift, just because he made it explicitly clear how he wanted that one community. And I believe he was right. But, you know, that doesn't take us nearly as far as the Muslims are trying to assert that, you know, he invented some entirely new ideology and religion that just... Um, had nothing to do with what was there originally. Paul did not believe or teach that the Jews were rejected by God and replaced by Christians. He didn't want to nullify the law. And he said himself that we uphold the law in Romans 3.31. And again, as we said towards the beginning, you know, Paul's life was not all wine and roses. I mean, this guy, when you, when you read, even just looking at the book of Acts, just the things he went through, I mean, stoned to death, left for dead, whipped, 
uh, almost assassinated several times by the Jews. He was constantly hunted, shipwrecked, robbed, bandits, everything. You know, he was an apostate Jew, essentially. And he had to deal with trouble from Gentiles. He had to deal with trouble from Jews. He had pressure from all sides. And yet, despite that, he still committed himself to this message. And he committed himself to preaching Christ. And so everything about his life and his commitment to that really attests to the fact that the last thing he wanted to do was develop his own thing. But instead, he wanted to, you know, truly push for what he saw was the true message of Christ, that the gospel, that the law and the prophets and everything before had been pointing to. And so we have a second question here. You know, was Jesus divine? This is where the Muslims will really try to have a field day because they'll say that, you know, Jesus didn't see himself as God. He was he was a Muslim and he he, he uh, taught to worship only Allah, only to worship, you know, the, the one one uh, Unitarian God, I guess, so to speak. But when Paul came along, he didn't care too much about the historical Jesus. And he instead wanted to create this own cosmic Jesus that he could worship. And so therefore, that's how they assert ideas like the Trinity came about. But again, Paul shared in common with all true other Christians that Jesus was the risen Lord, that Jesus was the son of God come in the flesh. And again, you can assert this even just looking at the gospels. You know, you can make a strong case for Jesus' Jesus's deity without even having to go to Paul's letters. And so his Christology was shared with his fellow followers of Jesus. And he explained, and even though he explained and applied these truths in fresh ways. And so to Paul, these were Jesus's unique, te these were Jesus's unique teachings, plus the portions of the Old Testament, which, which Jesus affirmed, for example, the Ten Commandments, plus the moral law of Christ, plus some early Christian teachings that originated after Jesus's time. And so even though Paul did not invent its doctrines or its ethics, he most consistently applied his truths until a community that was in accord with these truths emerged. And so as we go through this presentation, we'll begin to see now how Paul's teachings were, uh, were, with six, were with six aspects of Jesus' Jesus's teaching that already exist, such as the kingdom of God, the identity of Jesus, the significance of Jesus' death, Israel and the church, ethics, as well as eschatology. But first, we are going to take a detour into, once again, the insanity of Islam. It's sad that we have to keep going back to this, but this is actually a good point because it's a kind of polemic against them. Like I said, a, a, a version two or the Islamic dilemma 2.0. And so the question that we have to ask here when looking at these Islamic sources is, is Paul the third messenger sent from Allah? And the question is obviously yes. We have sources from, uh, well, we have, we have chronic verses coming from Pikthal, Sahih International, Yusuf Ali, which say, when we sent unto them twain, or let's go down to the second one, when we sent to them two, but they denied them, so we strengthened them with a third. And they said, indeed, we are messengers to you. Okay, so who are these people that this verse is talking about in 3614? Well, in the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, one of the most revered Islamic scholars, he says about this verse that regarding the passage, which says, so, reinfor so we reinforce them with the third, that this means we supported and strengthened them with the third messenger. Who was that third messenger? The names of the first two messengers were Shamun and Yohanna, which I believe translate to uh, and Peter and James, correct? Simon and John. Simon and John, my bad. Yeah, so Shamun, Simon, and then Yohanna, John. And the name of the third was Bulis, and the city was Antioch. And so my Islamic name here says that uh, Bulis is the Arabic name for the word Paul. So Bulis, Butris, Hana, Harun, etc. So right here, we see it affirmed that Allah has sent Paul to strengthen others. And so if Paul is really preaching this corrupted message, as the Muslims assert, they've got a much bigger problem on their hands than Paul himself. Their real issue is with the God who sent him, because Allah, if he's truly this omniscient being, must have known that Paul was going to intentionally and deliberately corrupt his message and take people away from Islam. And yet, despite that, he willingly sent him out, which I don't know, maybe he, maybe Allah's motives seem a bit disparaged. Yeah. And it says in the verses that, of course, a party of the children of Israel believed and a party disbelieved. And mm -hmm. Paul is of the party that believed. So they're calling Allah a liar. Yeah. If, 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 if he's part of the party that believed and you say that he was wrong, then what else do you have to turn to? 
You already can't turn to the party who disbelieve. There's nothing else. You're literally grasping for an imaginary idea that there's this, it, it, it's really a fantasy, you know, this idea that there's this true religion which perfectly corresponds with Islam from the first century, but it doesn't because it inherently contradicts. And that's why they have to throw, throw Paul under the bus. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, and uh, Ibn Kathir's left no way out here. Uh, you know, he uses the, the word that means Paul in, in Arabic, and then he says he's from Antioch in case you had wondered if it was some other Paul or, you know, the people just got confused. And of course, Ibn Kathir is kind of considered the top tafsir, you know, kind of tied with uh, Al-Tabri for the, the top tafsir. And are mistaken, Thaddeus, he's not a real Muslim as of <laughs> right now. <laughs> Not right now. Yeah. <laughs> He'll be yeah. in the comments section two days from now, but not right now. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, you know, once again, they're going to have to throw their top and most trusted scholars under the bus and say, you know, these people were just liars who didn't know anything about Islam. And unfortunately for them, they're not going to find anyone before the year 1050 or so who knew anything about the, the corruption of the gospel. You're not going to find anyone who uh, said that Paul was a, a fake apostle. They not, not everyone mentioned him, of course, but everyone who mentioned him mentioned him positively. Mm -hmm. So I guess right. there weren't any Muslims before 1050. That's just what I have to conclude. <laughs> and, and, look at, and look at what it says here in 6114. Then we strengthen. So, and as Lloyd said, and a party of the children of Israel believed while a party disbelieved. Then we strengthened those who believed against their foe and they became uppermost. So Paul's and uppermost. And them with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, man. So yeah, it's, it's very, and let, let, let's take a bit of a side note real quick about Jesus's crucifixion, because as we said, Allah can't seem to make up his mind, or I don't know if it's the Muslims or Allah at this point, but either way, there's a dilemma going on because not only is he creating some type of conflict by sending that, which he says is going to be uppermost, even though the Muslims say he was false and he taught heresy. Let's take another look regarding um, uh, Jesus's crucifixion and what went on during this. So Ibn Abbas said, when Allah decided to raise Isa, that's, the, that's Jesus, to heaven, Isa went to his companions while drops of water were dripping from his head. At that time, there were 12 men at the house. So I'm thinking this refers to the 12 disciples. And Isa said to them, some of you will disbelieve in me 12 times after having believed in me. I'm not sure if that's a reference to Peter denying Jesus three times, but if it is, they got the number wrong. Um, they get a lot wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, it says, uh, he then asked, so, so Jesus is saying, Isa said, uh, uh, some of you will disbelieve in me 12 times after having believed in me. And then he asked his disciples, who among you volunteers that he, that he be made to resemble me and be killed instead of me? He will be with me in my place in paradise. So whoever volunteers to die on the cross instead of me, you're going to get to go to heaven with me. And so one of the youngest men present volunteered. This might have been John. Who knows? But Isa commanded him to sit down. Isa repeated the statement and the young man again stood up and volunteered and Isa again told him to sit down. Isa repeated the same statement and the young man volunteered. This time, Isa said, then it will be you. The appearance of Isa was cast upon that young man, while Isa, peace be upon him, was raised to heaven through an opening in the roof of the house. Then the Jews came looking for Isa and arrested the one that appeared as him, killing him by crucifixion. So in other words, this is a very narrative way of saying that Allah is essentially responsible for Christianity, right? Because he made him appear like Jesus. He died on the cross and, you know, made it appear as if he was resurrected. And how can you blame them for now worshiping this one that they see as raised from the dead? Yeah. But there are two issues with this story. I mean, besides the fact that it runs contrary to the Bible, mm -hmm. one, it doesn't mention the name of the man. There are, there are contrary stories that, that, that contradict each other. There are other stories with different different details jesus was taken to heaven and becomes an angel with dual natures we'll see later and then muhammad died in agony from poisoning and allah creates a deception of jesus being crucified and resurrected then he punishes people for believing the deception that he created oh it's insane yeah, it's yet another islamic dilemma here i think because either uh it's false in which case islam's false or it's true in which case uh Allah is the most evil God imaginable that he would create the most popular religion on the planet on purpose, let the real message die out and then punish everyone for who believes that. And not only that, wait 700 years before he corrected <laughs> his own mistake. So And claim people and send people within the first century that he claims are uppermost that 
adhere to this false message that he put out. So I don't even, yeah, it, it's very interesting. A any comments uh, like, like it from the comment section or anything that you want to address that? Yes, sir. Uh, no, I think we're good. Okay, cool. And so this is where it gets a bit trippy because from this, you know, we can see that it's highly probable that this doctrine uh, that, that, you know, Jesus was just this apparition who didn't really suffer and experience these things uh, comes through the medium of monochaism, which actually I had a, I had a quick wiki here pulled up about that, that I wanted to share real quick. Let me open that real quick. Um, actually, what is yeah, interesting, these are Gnostic gospels, yeah. which are not only Christian and yet the Muslims believe them. So technically they go to the Maudu and Daif scriptures of a different religion and claim that this is Christian. Exactly. Look at this right here. Monotheism was a major religion founded in the third century by uh, the Persian prophet Mani. Monotheism taught an elaborate dualistic cosmology describing the struggle between a good spiritual world of light and an evil material world of darkness. Through an ongoing, through an ongoing process uh, that takes place in human history, light is gradually removed from the world of matter and returned to the world of light whence it came. Its beliefs were based on local Mesopotamian religious movements and Gnosticism. And it is it revered Mani as the final prophet after Zoroaster, Gautama Buddha. Buddha, and Jesus. So these Muslims are, they're not even staying within their own territory now and then attempt to discredit Christianity, which says a lot about the solid foundation of their own religion. And so, yeah, I mean, this is just, this is very interesting. Uh Adam Yak pointed out that it's actually worse than I described because Allah sent 124,000 uh, prophets to every nation on earth, and he's punishing everyone who believes in <laughs> all of those. Uh, I guess all their messages got corrupted, and uh, so he has a 99.999% failure rate, 123,999 failed prophets whose messages got corrupted, and then Muhammad, or it's complete nonsense. Uh, I'll let the audience decide which is more plausible. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so, I mean, again, a kind of quick summation here, biblical teachings clearly contradict the Quran. So therefore Paul is now that scapegoat because they say that Jesus was a Muslim and Paul applied Jesus's teachings in a, in a, in a heretical way in an effort to spread, you know, this, this false uh, religion of Christianity. But again, let's, let's not stop there. Let's take a closer look at what some of the most uh, revered Islamic scholars say about Paul, what the most revered Islamic sources say about Paul. And we'll conclude if he truly is this heretic that the Muslims claim him to be. So, uh, so in, in Gilliam's The Life of Muhammad, we see that he says, uh, from that, well, let's see, where do I want to start? That's a good uh, start. Yeah, let's start from here. So from that very night, every one of them was able to speak the language of the people to whom he was sent. Jesus said, this is a thing which God has determined that you should go that you should do so go those who whom jesus son of mary sent both disciples and those who came after them in the land were peter the disciple and paul with him paul belonged to the followers and was not a disciple so paul is called a follower here he's not called a heretic he's not called this outlier who's trying to spread a false message he's put on the same level as peter and so you he's can't put in on one the breath, same level as the followers of muhammad yeah yeah exactly and so you can't in one breath assert that the rest are on this level, but then try to throw Paul out when your most uh, authoritative sources, secondary sources are from the opposite. And again, let's, let's keep going. It says, um, so this is interesting here because it says here, the Christians assert that God granted him death for seven hours of the day and then resurrected him saying, this is talking about Jesus, descend upon Mary Magdalene on her mountain for nobody wept for thee as she did nor did anybody agree for thee as she did. Let her assemble for thee the apostles and send them forth as preachers for God, for you have not done that. So apparently this passage is assuming or, or saying that Jesus forgot to gather disciples, gather apostles to then send out. So instead, after he's resurrecting them, he wants Jesus to go tell Mary Magdalene to do it so that she can go and get the apostles. But yeah, and as, as you said, now, even as we go down, it says that then God raised Jesus unto himself and gave him the wings of an angel. That sounds that sounds like much more than a simple prophet to me. It's a bit of a side note, I know, but I mean, again, these sources have pit these Muslims into a corner. Yeah, and of course, this comes from our earliest complete source uh, about 
Muhammad. They, this yeah. predates anything written in the Hadith or Tafsir or whatever. Um, Muslims try to reject this source, of course, but mm -hmm. from a historical perspective, it's as close to the truth that we can find. And it certainly at minimum reflects the, even if it doesn't have accurate information about Muhammad, it would certainly reflect the beliefs that were common when it was written. So we can see yet again that the early Muslims, you know, they, they believed in Paul, they, they believed in uh, Christians, they, they thought they had the same message. And then later on, they discovered they didn't have the same message. And that's when they invented this idea that Paul had corrupted something. Exactly. And, and, and you guys just mentioned before, Atabri, and how he's just as revered, if not more revered than Ibn Kathir. And here's what he said about Jesus in volume four of his, The Story of Jesus. He says that he was both human and angelic, celestial and terrestrial. And then even more so about Paul, he says, among the apostles and the followers who came after them were the apostle Peter and Paul, who was a follower and not an apostle. And then again, yeah, Jesus is dual nature. Yeah, he's dual nature. So again, <laughs> this is exactly what that is just said. The sources affirm Jesus's deity, affirm his at least being more than a simple prophet. And the Muslims, they have to ignore that. They have to, you have to throw out your most revered scholar in, a, in an attempt to hang on to your dying or just hopeless arguments regarding the, pro, the simple prophethood of Jesus. Yeah, you know, we, we saw Ibn Kathir and now we're seeing Al Tabri, and uh, Muslims are running out of options here of which so, highly trusted scholars to yeah, go to. Ibn Isham, Tabri, and Ibn, Ibn Kathir. I'm mean, like, what else you got? <laughs> Muhammad Ijab or Ali Dawa, he got nothing. You know I mean? Look, and then they get this story wrong. Yeah, so uh, uh, let's see. So in volume four, same thing. He says, narrow route for 14 years. He slew Peter and crucified Paul head down. Yeah, so... The point here is that, they, is that he puts Peter and Paul on the same level. But yeah, just a side note, they get him wrong because historically we know that Peter was the one who was crucified upside down, whereas, uh, you know, Holy. Paul was the one who was sl uh, slown, uh, to be more specific, beheaded. So forget that. I mean, yeah, they get it wrong. But the point that we can draw away from this is that, again, they're put on the same level. Not uh, Nowhere referenced here is that Paul is this heretic who corrupted a message. Yeah. And Tabri puts Paul... On the same level as the Tabiyun, the followers of Muhammad, which means he's a loyal, mm -hmm. faithful follower. So there's no question. And then not only that, he puts Peter and Simon and all those guys on the same level as Muhammad, as messengers. Yeah, that's so true. And again, look look even right here too. Even if we go back to the Bible for a second, Paul is, he's here preaching the gospel with Barnabas. So then Paul and Barnabas uh, waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, we turn to the Gentiles. Uh, long time, therefore, abode by speaking boldly in the Lord. We gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So even though a lot of Paul's ministry was conducted solo because he was just simply traveling all over the place, um, he had those clear instances in which he was with other believers, either writing to them or they were directly alongside him in his journeys on ships to different islands or whatever and again if he were this if he were this rogue trying to corrupt the message and and, and put out his new uh, christ worshiping religion then people like barnabas would have said something about this but as that he said towards the beginning we don't we have virtually no sources which say anything you know outcrying against paul as if he's some heretic now obviously there were disagreements that he had to you know give his two cents on but nothing in which he's trying to simply start his complete own ideology. And so it falls flat completely. Yeah, actually, I thought just occurred to me, you know, if if Paul was actually changing the nature of Jesus, making him divine, then it would be rather silly that they're having disagreements over whether they should be circumcised or not. Yeah. So the fact that point. that was, you know, the biggest disagreement kind of proves that they were teaching the same message on Jesus's divinity. I didn't even think of that. That's a great point. Yeah. And so let's let's switch it up a bit. Let's let's attack the other end of the spectrum. Right. Because we've we've looked at Islam. It's, that's a case closed at this point. Right. But we also know that Christianity is under attack from atheist secularism, postmodern relativism and Islam as well. But specifically here, we want to look at, you know, some things that atheists have said as well. They'll say that Paul invented the majority of Christian doctrines. He did not teach the doctrines taught by or that Jesus did not teach the doctrines taught by Paul, yada, yada, yada. So here, for example, we have one of these books from an author by the name of uh, Chaim Maccabee. 
And in this book, The Myth Maker, Paul and the, Inven and the Invention of Christianity, this guy essentially says that uh, he argues that Jesus Christ never broke away from Judaism and that the Christian religion was founded by Paul. And this book was written in 1973. So I think it's fair to say he was a little displaced. But nevertheless, in his book, we see some of those insane views in which he says that Paul was not a Pharisee. He was he said that the Pharisees were the good guys. Paul was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was a Jewish convert and he was a Gnostic. He also says that Paul was a space alien, which oh, no, he didn't I don't say either. that. No, okay, that was me making a joke. Oh, okay, he couldn't, he couldn't decide what Paul was. Paul's not a Jew. Paul's a Jew. Paul's a <laughs> Gentile. Paul's a Paul's a Gnostic. You're like, which one, man? Yeah, you don't even recognize the implications of saying he's one or the other, right? The the Pharisees aren't going to be Gnostics. Uh, the Gentile, well, yeah, maybe the Gentiles could, but still. Uh, and then he also says, yeah, you know, we can't believe anything in Paul's writings. Ebionites are the true are the true Christians. These are Gnostics. Yeah, it's insane. Paul's elevation, Paul's elevation to Jesus, uh, Paul's elevation of Jesus to divine status was a reversion to paganism. And then, of course, to top it all off, he says that Jesus was a Pharisee. So his own Pharisees killed him. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's fair to say that the scholars had quite the things to say about his book. Here we see one quote, which says that thus, I must conclude that Maccabees, that Maccabees book is not good history. It's not even good history at all. Sorry, it's not even history at all. Whether it is good fiction is another matter. So this guy's living in fantasy land, apparently. And then again, you know, we have reviews here which just completely thrash it. And Lloyd, weren't you saying that this guy was like dean of, of, of Princeton? Or so, so the guy who wrote that review specifically, he was given the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching in 98. Uh, he won the Howard T. Burnham Award for Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities in 2005. He was a dean at Yale and at Princeton, and he was a major scholar. And he was just one guy that called this book utter trash. Wow. Wow. Incredible. <laughs> Same thing here uh, from Reza Aslan. We have Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. He says that 2,000 years ago, a Jewish preacher walked across the Galilee, gathering followers to establish what he called the kingdom of God. The revolutionary movement he launched was so threatening to the established order that he was executed as a state criminal. And within decades after his death, his followers would call him God. And in this book, he claims that Paul had an extraordinary lack of interest in the historical Jesus and was at loggerheads with the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem. And again, ridiculous. But I love the, th the point that Thaddeus had made earlier, you know, because if that were truly the case, the issues that they were uh, having contentions over would not have been the issues if this were truly going on. So... Th these books really are wishful thinking, but nevertheless, you know, they're there. If you guys want to check them out, you know, increase your knowledge, so to speak, or at least know how other people think regarding these things. But yeah, it's definitely very interesting. And then obviously to top it all off, we have none other than everybody's favorite, which <laughs> I love how there's no, no caption here either. We just, we just put his face, Richard <laughs> Dawkins, the God delusion. Um, that's definitely a book where he just kind of goes after the idea of God in general, but in it, he also makes the claims that Christianity was merely invented by Paul as well. And so here we have our brilliant scholars who are throwing their hats into the rings regarding this topic. Yeah, um, that first book is the source of much of the Islamic as well as atheist um, critiques against Paul. Oh, what a surprise. Book. Yeah, what a surprise. Because but, the, 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 the Christianity is actually a recent invention. It's actually a 20th century invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but before we move on, uh, well, first of all, to say what to go off what Lloyd was saying, the the original critics of Christianity, you know, when this idea of kind of looking at religion from a critical perspective arose in the 18th, 19th century, they thought that Christianity had really been invented much, much later than the time of Paul. Unfortunately for them, the evidence has kind of proven those theories to be impossible. So things yeah. had to be moved further and further back getting closer and closer to the time of the historical jesus and closer you get the you know you quickly run out of people to blame and all that's left is paul so that's how they <laughs> end up on that yeah, and then he... one other thing uh, before before you move on to our, our little video here oh yeah i want to say that you know th these types of theories that you know paul invented christianity or that Jesus wasn't a real person or that we don't know anything about the historical Jesus maybe existed, but that's all we can say. They're, they're very popular in online atheist circles, but they have no real support in scholarship. 
which mm-hmm. kind of makes you wonder why all these atheists are saying, you know, we just go where the evidence is, where, where the people who are really thinking about matters, and then they all end up supporting theories that have zero credibility in academia. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's kind of, you know, just seeing what you want to see and calling it uh, intelligent thought. It really is sad. I mean, because I, I feel like so much of it really comes down to, I want to say authority, but you know, there's, there's a famous clip of, it's kind of a different topic, but there's a famous clip with like Neil deGrasse Tyson, where he's being asked about, uh, you know, could theism be true? Could God exist? And he's like, oh, it's a dead issue. And your average atheist watch that, watches that and they, they think of Neil deGrasse Tyson as this, I mean, you know, the new Stephen Hawking of our time or whatever. And then they think, okay, it's case closed. And it's like, you know, have you read Craig? Have you read Alvin Plantinga? Have you read these, you know, but that never happens. It's all just about what's quickest and most accessible to use as an argument. But as Lloyd himself was telling me, once that gets exposed, it, I, I've noticed it's harder with atheists, but at least within Muslim circles, they're very quick to then just completely throw that out and then try to give a new narrative for, you know, why something is not true. So it, it, it's ridiculous, but I'm glad you said, Lloyd, that um, this guy, Haya Maccabee, has really been an inspiration to a lot of these Muslims because we also know that if there's anyone in a kind of Islamic trinity who would go in, but with with Allah and uh, Muhammad, and then if we were going to add a third one in, we all know it would be everyone's favorite, you know, Bart Ehrman here. And so, yeah. you have to be knowing that, with audio, right? huh? You have to be sharing with audio. Yeah, I'm sharing with audio. I made sure I checked it. And so, knowing that, I'm excited to get into this clip because Muslims quote Bart Ehrman like he's like, like he wrote like the Quran. And so we're going to hear his opinion on the idea of whether or not Paul invented Christianity and corrupted the Bible. And so let's go ahead and tune into this. It's very short, but you guys should enjoy it. Let me know if, if you, you had hear. to line all the apostles up. I get the vibe that for you, Paul is the cornerstone of the whole story. You hear it or no? Well, the reason I think he is is somewhat different from what a lot of people say. Uh, some people say that Paul invented Christianity, uh, and that can't be true because Paul was persecuting Christians before he became a Christian. And so, if he invented Christianity, he would have had nobody to persecute. So that's not right. Uh, and it's not right that he invented the idea that Jesus' resurrect, death, and resurrection brought about salvation because that's what. Christians were saying before him, the thing that made Paul really key, uh, as I as I argue in this book, is that he realized that followers of Jesus, this Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people, followers of Jesus did not have to become Jewish. Uh, you could be a you could be a converted pagan and believe in Jesus and in the God of Jesus, uh, but you didn't have to adopt the ways of Judaism. And this realization made it possible for Christianity to move away from being a sect within Judaism to being a worldwide religion. And if that hadn't happened, then uh, Christianity would have ended up with the kind of historical significance of other Jewish sects. So they'd be as historically significant as the Sadducees or the Essenes, who, you know, which are groups that are important for historians of ancient religion, but they're not exactly uh, the the sorts of things people worry about these days. And so, but so he made it possible for Christianity to be to to become what it did, which is the dominant religion of the empire. If uh, the Gospels of the New Testament were written long decades after the death, the you know the written death of Jesus Christ, we're not talking about reporting. How do we get the Gospels if they were written by people who didn't actually see it happen? Well, so what you do, I mean, historians do the same thing with the Gospels as they do with any other book. If they want to talk about um, if they want to talk about any figure in uh, Roman history, for example, if they want to talk about Pompey, for example, or Crassus or Brutus, they look at what kind of sources are available. And sometimes for ancient people, we have contemporary sources, but more commonly, we have sources that are decades or even centuries later. If you've got independent sources that, that did not collaborate with one another, but they are they absolutely are independent of one another, and they all mention the same figure, uh, that, that is pretty good evidence that there was a figure. Uh, with, with the Gospels, uh, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use the, some of the same sources, but usually scholars, uh, scholars typically isolate four different sources behind Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, behind Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
four sources, and they isolate three or four sources behind the Gospel of John. Paul had access to none of that stuff because Paul was writing before all that, and they didn't have access to Paul. You start adding up the sources, and you end up with 10 or 12 sources independently within a few decades that are all talking about this man Jesus. Uh, so if they'd all gotten it from one source, you'd say, well, somebody made it up. But it's kind of hard to say somebody made it up when you have all of these sources. Awesome. Any thoughts there, guys? Anything you want to say? Yeah, yeah. You know, I got several things I'd like to say. Um, first of all, that that last portion, what Ehrman's saying is, you know, you evaluate the the truth of the Gospels the way you evaluate any other historical fact, and you know, I I, I say exactly. That's exactly what you do. Now, uh, I don't come to the same conclusion as Ehrman, obviously, and I think that he's pretty often very sloppy in the way he handles things that he doesn't actually he's giving lip service to this idea that you treat it like a historical source but then he just ends up throwing it out for reasons uh in his popular level works i mean let me be clear in his popular level works he says things that he could never get away with in his actual scholarship because because it, he which is which is part of the reason why i have such a low opinion of him you know he he kind of speaks from from two sides here because he knows that things sound really bad like when you say for example talk about so-called contradictions in in the accounts that sounds really bad when you talk about it to a public audience but to a, a scholar that's that's an encouraging thing because it shows their independent accounts and you have a better uh, access to the the truth of the matter by looking at multiple perspectives of it so that's the one thing i want to say is that he's saying you know treat these like historical sources and i agree treat them like historical sources and i think you'll find that they stand up to scrutiny then the other thing that he's said is you know that paul couldn't have invented christianity we of course agree on that and that's the main reason we showed this clip and then he said that you know paul was responsible for bringing the gospel to the gentiles you know that that's partially true but i think that we probably have actually overestimated paul's importance in that you know we have this very high view of him um, as far as his historical significance because he wrote so much of the New Testament, but there was other people going to the Gentiles. They just didn't leave any writings behind. So mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know how big their impact was. Yeah, but also, but we can see, I was gonna say, but we can see that there was already a large church in Rome. We can see this from the fact Paul was writing to him, but we, but we also see it from Roman sources that there was a large population of Christians in Rome that Paul had absolutely nothing to do with. Right. So I don't think it's accurate to say that Paul invented this idea of bringing it to the Gentiles and the book of Acts would agree. I, I think he means that is that Paul is best known for preaching to the Gentiles and for yeah. making the argument. And then he also says that Paul was, wasn't was that well, if you read, if you watch the rest of the clip online, he does say that Paul wasn't that famous in his day. It was much later that people realized the value and the strength of his intellect and his writing. And then he's his profile grew. So it happened well. Off All right. So, yeah. So then he would agree that, um, you know, we've overstated Paul's significance as far as spreading Christianity goes, that it, he was certainly a significant figure, but if, it's not like if he didn't um, exist, that Christianity would have died out. And, you know, in Acts, we see that it's actually Peter's vision that uh, allows the church to be brought to the Gentiles, not anything Paul did. And, you know, uh, there was a, even before Paul had become a Christian, there was the question arise, what do we do about Gentiles? And then Peter has the, the dream of the unclean food. And in, in context, it's used to show that people can come uh, join the Christian movement without becoming Jews. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I wanted to say, which is kind of just an aside, but he says, you know, uh, what about all these other Jewish sects? Uh, Christianity could have been like one of them that just died out and, and stopped existing. Well, you know, what did happen to all those Jewish sects? Uh, there was probably around eight or 10 different Jewish sects active at the time of Jesus. Only one of them uh, survived and became modern Judaism. Uh, that would be the sect that the Pharisees belonged to. But what happened to the rest? Well, I think one, we don't know for sure, but I think one plausible guess is that the majority of people in all these other sects became Christians. And that's why they disappeared, because they stopped being distinctly Jewish and they became part of the, the Christian movement. Hmm. We're going to say something, Lloyd? Uh, no, no. That's too good. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Thaddeus. I, I think, because I, yeah, I think we have to remember that, like, regarding Paul and, like, his work, it's, it's not natural for one person to have to, like, bear the brunt of 
taking it across an entire you know region like that. And so obviously Paul was most well known for it. I'm sure he had an amazing impact. But what we often forget is that the gospel and evangelization is like a telephone kind of effect. So let's say he goes to Syria or something and like he preaches to a church there and then just one person converts. You know, that person could have been like the next Billy Graham or something in terms of his evangelism and goes out and he never writes anything down. But obviously then he goes out, does the same thing that Paul's doing and it just, it just spreads and spreads. And so, yeah, I mean, Paul definitely, you could, you could definitely say he got the ball rolling and he had an amazing impact. But, but you can say one point is that of the, the apostles were largely, I think, uneducated. Paul was a very highly educated man. Yeah, that's very true. Highly educated. So the quality of his thought and the quality of his writing is what sets him apart. Mm -hmm. And this is what survived. So he, he articulated the ideas of Jesus and applied them and, and applied them ethically much better than all the other guys did. So I think yeah. this is what eventually made his status grow. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we say all that and show that to just say how, you know, Paul was not this rogue. He was not this guy who, again, I mean, we're hammering this point home, but he really wasn't this arbiter of some unknown, you know, false religion that was completely distinct from what Jesus taught. So I, I just hear that. Read, Go ahead. Uh, one comment from the, the chat that kind of summarizes this uh, misuse of Bart Ehrman by the Muslims. Uh, Tatooine says, Bart Ehrman is Muslim's worst nightmare if they listen to him for more than 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> earlier, someone said, whenever someone a Muslim brings up Bart Ehrman, I bring up Dan Wallace, which is perfectly legitimate, you know, because they, they work in the same area of textual criticism. But another thing you can do is just quote them Bart Ehrman, because they don't really agree with him. They, they, they know the title of his book is The Orthodox Corruption of Scriptures, and they're like, Oh, he says the Bible's been corrupted. He must agree with us on everything. <laughs> He's ready to take the Shahada. <laughs> what did he say? He said he said the day I criticized the Quran is the day I stopped valuing my life, or something like that. Yeah, it's insane. Okay, so looking at this next section here, an important passage that we often see regarding this is Matthew five, where Jesus himself says, uh, "Think not, I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill." For verily I say unto you, till heaven, and, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall uh, in, no wise, in no wise pass away from the law, so all the things be accomplished. And so again, from the critics, what you'll often hear is, see, Jesus himself said that he's here to fulfill the law and the prophets. And Paul, as one who says that you no longer need to be bound by the law, shows that he has this departure from what Jesus originally taught. And as I talked with uh, Lloyd about this earlier, you know, what I said was, that would be true if the assumption that the law and the prophets were this kind of uh, permanent thing, you know, was the case. You know, you're assuming that the law and the prophets don't point to the very new covenant that Jesus came to usher in. Right. And as Lloyd said so well, he said, when a contract, when a covenant is fulfilled, it no longer applies. It's not an indefinite agreement that is meant to go on until eternity. It's a, it, it's a, it's a temporary agreement, which is simply meant to point to the future endeavor. And Jesus was that future endeavor. And so when he says he's not destroying the law of the prophets, it's not because he's meant to uh, keep them in perpetuity. Uh, it's meant to show how the law and the prophets point to him, because he himself even said that everything in the scriptures is written of him. So another important point there, but obviously just one I wanted to take the time to at least kind of briefly explain. You're on this as well, just briefly, that they will also say, look, till heaven and earth pass away. They'll say that that means to eternity, but there is figurative language of the period and in the Bible till the heaven and earth pass away is referred to as the age. And you have the age before Jesus, and then you have the age after, right? He ushered in the new age, and that's addressed as well. If you look at Matthew and you look at some of the other um, Isaiah, so mm -hmm. right God here. says there will come a new age. He doesn't mean he'll destroy the earth and then make a new one. There'll be a new age which will start and this is long before the end times so the new age is not the end of the earth not the end times it's just when there's a new beginning jesus is the new beginning that's what that means and people try to take that literally and it's not meant like that because it's used in other passages and it just means a period hmm. yeah so keep if we keep going here it says that again when we also have to what we also have to consider is that the law and the prophets 
uh, you know, it refers to, it, it doesn't refer to some type of like, you know, tank. I mean, yes, the Ten Commandments are included, but it's not strictly that, you know, specifically it refers to the first five books known as the Torah and then obviously some of the minor prophets as well, like the other seven. Well, the, the law is, is really a reference to the first five books of the Bible. It's a nickname. Yeah. For it. It's not like Jesus has to keep laws. It's just the law is the first five books and those books all have prophecies referring to Jesus. So he mm -hmm. came to fulfill those prophecies and now they were fulfilled. So that period, that age is done. Yeah, exactly. And so when we wrap up some final points here, we can see that there were tensions between Paul and other Jewish Christians. Paul is honest about these, especially as we see in Galatians. Um, and even though Matthew is often used as evidence against Paul to show that he was in conflict with him, the reality is that it just presents more of a Jewish Christian perspective. You know, and Paul wrote letters, he wrote epistles, he didn't write the gospels, largely because Again, he was writing to an audience that should have already been aware of these things. So there wasn't a need to flesh them out and repeat. And then we also see how the epistles were letters to assist the church in dealing with its issues. Not meant to merely instruct as the gospels were. It was more about application. And so they assume the knowledge of Jesus' teachings and they refer to reminders of Jesus' teachings. And so all of this actually helps to affirm that Paul was really there, really involved in the process. Because you everything that you would have expected logically and his line of thought and what was reflected through the writing is exactly what we see. And so again, we see it referenced in verses as well, like 1 Corinthians 7.10. Paul's not making up his own teachings. For example, he says, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And so he's never speaking on behalf of his own authority, but on, on, on the Lord's. And again, that's meant to clearly show his adherence to uh, you know, Christ and to that original message. Yeah. But he's also honest in the next passage where he does exegesis of Jesus' words because Jesus spoke in the context of a Christian man and woman, husband and wife. Whereas yeah. the context he's given is what if you have a Christian husband or wife and a non-Christian wife or husband, right? And he says, well, then I speak to that. He's very honest where he's speaking. He's saying, well, then I say, if you have a wife that does not believe and you are happy, then do not divorce her. Then, then that rule applies to you as well. Don't break the bond of marriage. It's still sacred even if only one of you is Christian. So that he's, is him doing exegesis, but he admits it's him applying the ideas of Jesus ethically. Awesome, yeah, exactly. Same thing right here in, uh, in verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife, I believe not, and she be pleased to go with him, let him not put her away. And so also interesting to notice that the term Pauline Christianity didn't even exist until the 20th century. And so a lot of these really were late developments that, really have no weight when examined critically and, look, and, and, and looking at the data. So if Paul invented Christianity, then one would expect that his teachings would be different from that of Jesus, the other apostles, and the disciples. But as Christians, we claim that Paul met Jesus and that he had, he had that direct encounter with him. And so knowing this, he, we, we would expect him to passionately proclaim the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, a gospel which doesn't contradict from what Jesus has said. And from his original message. And that's exactly why in his message, Paul's message, we see doctrines of atonement of sin through Jesus' death on the cross, as well as justification through faith. Yeah. And Paul himself said that he, that he received this message by way of Jesus Christ. And so everything that we would expect to see here, we do see. And the, uh, the accusations about him corrupting things or starting something out of his own accord really just don't hold any water when looking at them. You know, Jesus clearly indicated that his purpose was to come to die on a cross for the sins of the world. You know, he says in Matthew that his blood is the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And he says no one takes his life from him, but he, that he has the power to lay it down and to take it up again. And so from this, we can clearly see that this was his mission all along. And Paul proclaimed that same message as he was converted um, by the same risen Lord. So, yeah, so we also see that this concept was, I'll go ahead, Lloyd. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Maybe we should bring up the table so people can see that. Uh, yeah, I was going to right here. So this is a very, very valuable, valuable resource here where we just have a kind of conglomerate centralized table in which you can clearly see various doctrines that were first taught in the Old Testament, uh, also taught by Jesus, as well as Paul and other disciples as well to show their origin, how they're, you know, how, how they're concrete. They have they have their foundation within the Old Testament how Jesus affirms them, how Paul is in line with them, and how he's not in uh, hostility with any of the other disciples as well. And so let me actually go ahead and 
And, and while you're, you're pulling that up, I just want to yeah. make the point that, you know, these are our, our core Christian doctrines here. We're not doing like the, the Muslim game where they're like, how, how is Muhammad like Moses? Well, uh, they're both male. All right. That's one thing. Uh, let's see. They both <laughs> married, got married. Oh, that's two ways they're like, man, th this case is getting really strong here. You know, uh, we're not we're not taking trivial similarities between and, uh, Paul's teachings and Jesus and Jesus's teachings as found in the Gospels and the Old Testament prophets teachings as found in the Old Testament. You know, these are core Christian beliefs here. And as you can see, uh, all of them are affirmed not just by Paul, but the Gospels and other letters not written by Paul and the Old Testament. Exactly. And so I already had some of them pulled up here just ahead of time. And so, for example, in the Old Testament, we see how Isaiah chapter 53 points to the sacrifice, um, the, the coming sacrifice of the Messiah for the sins of the world. You know, just taking a few verses, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like, uh, like, have sheep, like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned up to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of, of us all to fall on him. And then let's go to Matthew. Like as we just saw, Jesus himself says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then, okay, so we know what the Old Testament says. We know what Jesus says. We know he's affirming this. So what evidence do we have that Paul blazed his own trail and, and was a road trying to spread some different message? Well, we have Colossians 1.20 in which he says, and through him to reconcile him all things, sorry, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether on things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So here, Paul clearly references the peace made through the blood of the cross, um, through the blood of his cross, that's also referenced in Isaiah 53, and how, you know, Christ's sacrifice, the Messiah's sacrifice was meant to bring, bring peace and harmony between us and God. And then we also see it with the other disciples as well. First Peter 1, 18 to 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So Old Testament, Jesus, Paul, and the other, and, and you know, the original 12 disciples, they're in harmony. And so right there, there's really not a case to assume that Paul was some type of rogue. If we just take one more, I think the next one I chose was repentance. And Isaiah 127 says that Zion will, will be redeemed with justice and her repentance, uh, sorry, and her repentance, repentant one with righteousness. Okay, and what does Jesus say? From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, and so what did Paul do? Was he a rogue? Did he, did he go against Jesus? No, what did he say? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And then finally, Matthew 3, 2, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So again, just two examples. And you know, you're free to go through the rest of the chart, but you can clearly see how this message is constantly being reverberated by all four parties. And there's no evidence of some type of uh, schism or, 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 or rogueness going on that's warranted. And that's just two examples. I mean, there are tons of sources here that are extremely valuable. And so any comments there, guys, or I just uh, well, we, we did have a can see the rest of it. You just yeah, yeah. Up. We can go through. Let's yeah. yeah. Actually, I want to show you guys this one too. Uh, before before you go on to another example, uh, there was some comments about how they would like to get the this graph, and we'll definitely post the uh, either an image to, uh, of that or a link to that in. The... Um, I can share this. Um, I will share. The, yeah, you've got the link, right? Can you just share it in the comments, so I will email it to you, or whatever, and we can just share this publicly, so everyone can have access to it. Yeah, well, I think it would be beneficial to, you know, pull out that chart as a standalone picture so that people could just share that picture um, yeah. you know, on social media or whatever. Right. Yeah, I can, it, I can actually, that's what I'll do. I, well. I'll pull out the chart and then I'll add, you know, like in big letters, like, did did Paul change Christianity? And then people can right. share the fit image. Yeah, and so there was, a, there was another chart, part two of the chart here. Let me show you real quick where we see more of that. We see more explicit uh, references between what Paul says and well, between what Jesus says and then what Paul later refers to. And a prime example of this is in 1 Thessalonians 5.2, in which Paul writes compared to what Jesus is said to have uh, said in Luke 12.39. So let's go through those real quick. We see in 1 Thessalonians 5.2, 
that Paul wrote. Well, actually, let me start with Jesus first. He says that, but be sure of this, that at the head of the house, had known at the hour the thief was coming, he would have not allowed his house to be broken into. So this is a reference to this idea of the thief in the night and the Lord's coming and how it's not expected. And so, you know, one should be on guard regarding it. And again, does Paul give some type of different message regarding this in his eschatology? Well, no, he most clearly references the explicit term. He says, for you yourselves know, again, assuming that they know, full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. So this idea that Paul was trying to break away from Christ's teaching, again, is just, it, it's unwarranted just by looking at these two sources alone. And again, there's a whole chart here. And so I'll be excited for you guys to definitely go through this and I'll be able to share this with others and, and know it for yourself as well. Do you guys want to add anything on it? Well, we I, think that that, I think that that one's especially great because not only does he reference the words of Jesus, he says, as you guys already know, and then gives mm -hmm. the quote, um, showing that when he's there preaching, he, he's, you know, giving a lot of these quotes that are found in, in the Gospels. He's talking about the things Jesus said and did. And the letter is just an occasional letter in, in response to specific questions, specific problems that arose in the church. He's not trying to teach them the gospel message. They already know that, you know, like we've been saying throughout the presentation, but this is kind of Paul's saying the same thing that, you know, you, you guys have already been taught the gospel. You've already been taught about Jesus's words. I'm just reminding you because I'm making a point. Exactly. So true. So true. And again, that's just one of many here. So definitely be sure to go through that. And so a final point here we can look at is this idea that Paul never addresses the physical Jesus. Apparently, they, they, they must have thought that he was in some type of la-la land because he only refers to a kind of celestial Jesus um, in which, you know, obviously he worships. But this claim is false because although the claim is believed by a number of skeptics who probably haven't even read most of Paul's New Testament books, we can see from clear sources here that he says how Paul indicates that Jesus came into the world, that he himself saw him. Paul says that Jesus was a man. Let's look at that one. Ooh, which one is that? Hold on. I don't even know which one it was referring to. I think it was so a bunch of them. Uh, yeah, there's I so know, many on that page. You can click on it, it'll go to the web. But the, the thing is that, that if you just scroll down a little bit, you'll see there's, there's, a, there's a reference from the different Gospels of Paul and others so that you can see that it's the same across all of these along with other Christian scholars. Yeah, so, I'll, go, I'll go back real quick, but I, I did find it right here where he says, uh, 27... Having this attitude in yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus, uh, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not, regard, did not regard equality with God to be a thing to grasp, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made into the likeness of men. So right there, you know, and so, yeah, let's go ahead and check out the rest of, of all these other references as well. That Jesus came into the world. Jesus was flesh. Jesus ate and drank. He bled. He was crucified and he died. So it's all here. It's all here. And it looks like that is essentially the end of it, because now down here we just have the references. But ultimately, I think the point of this that we can take away is, okay, if we know that Paul really was sent by Allah, as the sources confirm, if we really know that he wasn't there to corrupt the message and he was in harmony with, with what Jesus said, the Old Testament says, and the rest of, and, and the original 12, or the, the, the Jesus' disciples, then we have to be forced to come to terms with, with the message he was preaching. And for the Muslim, you know, this is a, this is a hard thing. I, I get the contemporary atheists will still have a million different reasons to try to doubt, you know, the veracity of, uh, of the Christian account. But especially for the Muslim, you know, you've been backed into a corner by your own sources. Again, we haven't said anything here that that hasn't been relayed. We're just simply messengers. And so what I really just want to reverberate for anyone watching either now who's a Muslim or uh, later down the line, or even to the atheists, you know, is that this message that Paul preached impacted him and it changed him and it sent him all around the world speaking the truth. And that message, as you've been obviously able to see here in this presentation, is that, you know, Christ died on the cross for our sins and he was raised from the dead to prove that he was who he said he was, you know, because we're all sinners. We all have broken that law. And, and, and unlike Islam, as we saw towards the middle of the presentation, there's no amount of law keeping or no amount of ritual, you know, keeping that can ever save you. 
for the Muslims out there. You know, you've, you, you serve a God who can't seem to make up his mind about who's really uppermost and who's really from him. I mean, he created Christianity, essentially, and yet he punishes everyone for believing it. But at the end of the day, the main issue is that there's no amount of good you can do to truly please Allah. I mean, because one, yes, he can't even seem to make up his own mind, but even if he could, no amount of good you can do, no amount of fasting or prayer or whatever else could ever take away the fact that you've sinned and you're guilty. And Paul recognized that. And that's exactly why he was so insistent upon not living under the law, because he knew that that very law, although good, was a law which condemned because none of us are perfect. We can't do it. We can't keep it. And so for the Muslim watching, I know you've probably seen a lot of things today which are infuriating, maybe upsetting, things you don't want to grapple with. But as I said, we're only messengers. And so the issue here is not with us, it's with the sources. And so I would invite you to just definitely check out these charts. Definitely check out, you know, what Paul really says here in relation to Jesus. And when you see that their messages are in harmony, then you'll know that if they're preaching the same message, and that's a message that is an obvious contradiction with Islam, which means that you have a dilemma on your hands, and it's a dilemma that you must uh, deal with. And I pray that that ends in you turning to Christ, just as Paul did, because he recognized that there was no hope in the law or in works that could, that could save him and make him right with God, because no amount of good will ever take away the bad. And if the God that you serve is just and holy, then you must always still be punished for the bad, which means hell. And so... Definitely consider the sources we've talked about today. Definitely consider what's been going on. And rather than hardening, hardening your heart, as we said at the beginning of the prayer, you know, we just ask that you would consider it. And so uh, I thought this was amazing information, and I feel very grateful to have been able to present it. And ultimately, I just pray that those who are listening will honestly grapple with it as well and uh, come closer to the truth. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, you know, with the gospel message, uh, that'd be a great way to end. But we will go ahead and provide some time for people to ask questions if yeah, they have yeah. any. Um, there was some uh, chatter throughout about people saying, you know, this is really useful material, how they'd like to take it and share it with other people. And, you know, absolutely. That's exactly what we want you to do. And, uh, I always make it explicit of my videos by releasing them under a Creative Commons license so that uh, no one has to ask whether they have permission to use it or whatever. You're explicitly granted permission by the terms of the copyright to take material, uh, you know, take out a clip, modify it, use it, share it, upload it to your own channel, whatever you want to do with it, go right ahead. The purpose of this is, you know, not to make our, our ourselves have uh, many fans or whatever. Uh, our point is to get the, the gospel message across to get this useful information out there because you know most people are ignorant of this type of material uh, long before i got interested in islam i heard many times from atheists how paul didn't know anything about the physical jesus or the human jesus he only knew about this imaginary cosmic jesus uh and it, it's just such nonsense when when you look at the texts he he talks about all kinds of physical things as that list pointed out then you, then you talk to other atheists and they say the exact opposite. They say, uh, it, Paul only knew about a human Jesus. He had no idea he was divine. That doesn't exist in his writings. It's like, really, have you bothered to read his writings? He equates Jesus with God over and over again. Some of the highest theology of the, of the, the Bible is, is found in Paul's letters. Uh, you know, it's found other places too. It's not exclusive to Paul, but it's certainly found there. And it's like, all I can conclude is that, you know, people aren't really reading. Uh, and if they are reading, they're just reading it to find fault. They're not actually thinking about things. They, you know, the, what, I, what I think happens is a lot of times is, you know, say someone who's raised Christian and they, they have decided that they don't want to believe in God for whatever reason. You know, they, they don't like the, the moral teachings of the church. Uh, they don't want to follow those. Or you know they've encountered personal loss or suffering in their lives and they're angry and they they don't think that God would have allowed that if He exists or whatever reason they come up with, you know primarily an emotional reason. Then they go and look for evidence and surprise surprise they find evidence that backs yeah. the position they've already concluded it is true. Uh, I don't think very many people go to the evidence first and then decide their position based on that. 
I know Muslims certainly don't because they don't have the slightest clue what, what the, the Bible actually teaches. You know, if you want to reject the, the truth of Christianity, then you should reject it on its own terms, not your own made up fake version of Christianity. <laughs> You know, you know, Thaddeus, forgive, forgive me if this even sounds a little abrasive, but like I wanted to like I, I, I just for like myself personally, like I wanted to stop the presentation after like 15 minutes because to me it was already case closed. Right. And like it's frustrating sometimes, but look, and, and I'm by no means a scholar. I'm not I'm, I'm by no means a professional in apologetics, but it's just frustrating when you spend so much time, you know, asking yourselves like the deepest questions about Christianity and existence and the nature of reality and God and all these things and you think okay you know I'm going to go out into this field and, and and grapple with like some of these toughest issues with the greatest minds you know and then you start a presentation and and, and the topic is you know something that is like so basic that it's like uh, you know like I get I get people are all different they're all uh they're all at different points in their path intellectually like you know and how and how much they've learned I'm not knocking them for that but that doesn't seem to stop them from being so quick to be so vocal about it and to outcry against it. And it's like, look, like you said, if you're going to call out Christianity, like give me something of more substance here, you know, not something that is so clearly evident just from a simple reading of the writings. Um, and so, but again, it's not about us. It's about the people. And, you know, hopefully even if someone believes this will be enough to actually get them to have a double take and stop and think about what they've believe, been believing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, on that point, I, I mean, when I was making this, the crux of it was really those tables of the matching verses where Paul, with what he says, matches identically with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, and then all the rest, right? But I realized I also had to add detail about the narrative of Paul because we, we, many, I think many Christians are on the fence because they're learning Christian doctrine from people who hate Christianity. Yes. They're learning it from people who are, have distorted the, the scripture. So I needed to create a basis for, for understanding the narrative in an, in an accurate context. So, so the, the opening is really just an introduction. And I mean, even to me, that's compelling and convincing. Mm -hmm. But I think when you look at how Paul's doctrine matches precisely with the rest of the, of the Bible, with all of these hundreds of verses I've put here, I mean, and this, that's not all my work. And I can't take credit for that. that but but the, the fact is it's irrefutable. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And, and thank you, Lord. You know, I know, I know a lot of these come from other sources, but you still took the time to compartmentalize it and do all of it. And that's huge. No, that's huge because even though this is to me a very simple topic that's easy to answer, I mean, you took it and you just, you know, grand slammed it out of the park with just the thoroughness and the details. And so, as you said, it, it's case closed after this. And so, um, nevertheless, I, regardless, I, I think it's really great work here. And so I'll be excited to use it and share it with other people. Yeah, I hope people will share it around. Um, you know, the, this stuff, we need to get this out there. So please use it. If you need anything more, I'm always in the comments, drop a note, send me an email, whatever. I'm happy to help. I've shared the database. We'll put the links out. That is my, we can maybe comp make some PDFs, make some Word documents, whatever you need, you know, so that you can get this out to people who need this to refute the lies that's out there because I am so tired of the lies. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, let's take a couple of quick uh, comments and questions before we sign off. A little while ago, Andy asked, is it written Jesus Christ? taught Paul in the wilderness for three years after the road to Damascus. Uh, so this would be kind of an inference that people might guess. It, it might be in some later source, but it would clearly be derivative, even if it said that explicitly. So in Galatians 1, 17, Paul says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with uh, Cephas, which would be another name for Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So we don't really know precisely what Paul was doing in those three years. So people speculate uh, what was going on. Um, I'm not saying that he definitely wasn't being taught by, by Jesus, but there's uh, no indication of that in the text. That would be a complete guess. Mm -hmm. uh, anything you guys would like to add to that? I've thought about it personally. Like, I think it's interesting. Like, dang, like, like he kind of like was like a monk for three years or something and just, you know, but yeah, there's not enough there to be able to say. I mean, it should be really cool, though. If he had like Jesus as his per personal guide, I guess. I mean, because I mean, look, you could almost say that there was like a parallel, right? Because Jesus's ministry lasted three years and 
Paul went out for three years. And so I'm not saying Jesus taught him, but if he did, I mean, it'd be a pretty cool parallel. Do you want to stop sharing? Then we can. Oh, that. yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. So Adam Yak made a comment that atheists make better arguments than Muslims. Um, that's certainly sometimes true. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some. Yeah. Pretty... The, you know, Muslims often make these very juvenile, asinine arguments. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes atheist arguments consist of, you can't prove your position, therefore I'm right. Uh, it's not really an argument at all. They don't have any evidence to offer. They're just saying, uh, well, you can't, you can't prove there's a God, so I win by default. And I don't feel like that's a very good argument either. Uh, what do you guys yeah. think? Yeah, I mean, like, for example, you have like, and, and Thaddeus, I'm sure you've heard of this too, you know, oftentimes the atheists are like, oh, well, you know, atheism isn't a belief that there, it, it's, it, it's, it isn't a belief that there's no God, it's a lack of belief. And I'm like, you know, I was even just reading last night, uh, a couple nights ago. Atheism is their belief that their belief is a lack of belief. It's ridiculous. Look, I, I was literally, I was on, I was on a, I was just on Google and I just typed in God and I just wanted to see like what would come up. And I was just reading. And then I saw like different views, you know, like Gnosticism, uh, theism, deism, et cetera. And it was funny because it, it was on Wikipedia. So you can tell they were trying to be politically correct about it. Wikipedia was saying like, oh, theism is a belief that there's, no, uh, that there's a God. Deism is a belief that there is a God, but he's not a sustainer. Agnosticism, you know, God can't be known. So these are all objective claims about God. And then it gets to atheism and it says, atheism is the lack of belief in a God. And I'm like, okay, so you're telling me if you prove that atheism is true, then the only thing that you prove is that you don't believe, right? <laughs> that does nothing to tell me whether or not God actually exists. So that's what I say to them whenever I hear that. Like, okay, I understand you have a lack of belief, but what does that do to, just because you believe in something or you don't believe in something, that doesn't change whether or not God exists. Yeah, so the make the claim. Yeah. Go ahead, Lloyd. Yeah, well, what's the position on, well, what's your claim on the existence or non-existence? Yeah, yeah. just means you don't believe. Yeah, look, it's ridiculous. It's just word games. Semantic smokescreen. Uh, there was some chatter back and forth between thunderous one who uh, you may have seen on my channel about a month ago sharing his testimony um, about his future plans and i'd like to make an announcement that i will be having him again on my channel soon to discuss a uh, we haven't picked the topic but we'll be discussing one of several problems within islam uh, if you didn't see my previous interview with him be sure to check that out it's called uh, from abused to beloved uh, is his personal testimony, but he also has a very um, frank and upfront style, which a lot of people really appreciated. He explains why both uh, Islam and atheism are untenable in that video. As someone who, for a good period of time, believed first in Islam and then in atheism, and he found both of them to be non-tenable when you really look into the matters. Uh, we have a request from Adam Yak. He says, can you do a live stream on Daniel Wallace's book, Dethroning Jesus and Revisiting the Corruption of the New Testament? Uh, that's yeah. definitely definitely a possibility of something to look into. Yeah, but I don't think they appreciate how much research. That's probably 20, 30 hours of research before wow. you're even ready to do a 90-minute live stream. Yeah. Uh, uh, May, may, so what I what I can try to do is I can reach out to Dan Wallace and try to have him on to explain his own material. Then it won't be so difficult. I'll at least give that a try. Um, you know, to me, textual criticism is not that important, but because of the popularity of Ehrman, it has become really important. You know, uh, the fact that the, the fundamental doctrines haven't changed, I, I think that's kind of like, you know, end of story. The, minor details aren't that important. And, you know, they're more certain of the New Testament than any other book of ancient history. But of course, because of, of Ehrman's popularity and his, uh, let's just say, talent for creating sensational titles <laughs> that, that make it sound like uh, Christianity is ridiculous to believe in, uh, it's something that needs to be addressed for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Speed and Angel says the problem is atheists have underlying beliefs. You just don't, they just don't want you to test them. I, I certainly agree with that. And, you know, that, that, that's a good thing about talking to Muslims is that at least you share the, the same fundamental picture of the universe that, you know, there's a God in charge of everything. 
And you're hopefully not just playing games where you say, you can't prove your belief, so I win. Uh, I don't get that from Muslims all, very often, at least. Now, their, their beliefs, their confidence is often based on a distortion of Christianity rather than anything in Islam. But at least that can be corrected when you have an atheist that says, it doesn't matter if the odds of creating of the universe coming to exist on its own are one to 10 to the 300th power, a number that's so intestinally small that we can't even describe what it would look like. It doesn't matter. It exists. So it obviously happened. Let, you can't prove God exists. And the atheist position is give us the first miracle and we'll explain all the rest. <laughs> you know, the universe just somehow magically came into being and after that we will explain everything it's yeah whatever yep so uh let's see i think uh oh there was one question about uh whether i'd be willing to debate a muslim from indonesia or malaysia so i'll just give my thought on debate uh i'm not a huge <laughs> fan of debates i i, I feel like a debate 90% of the time turns into each of the two parties presenting their pre-prepared lecture in, in three chunks or whatever number you agree to, and they don't really interact with each other in any way. So it's not any more beneficial than just watching the two of them individually. And then on top of that, there's the problem that people will judge based on your charisma and how confident you sound and you know how how you well know, you say things not your arguments to the truth yeah i have an idea for that i mean look i'm not desperate to do debates either but what i think would be interesting is if people said okay let's do a stream where me and a muslim well i mean not necessarily myself will go through the sharia text and discuss them <laughs> what do they mean so that let's open up your best sharia manual from your school and let's talk through it says you chop off his head if he leaves the religion kill him you can burn him, you can hang him, you can stone him to death if he, if he uh, becomes an apostate. So, and he'll say that that that, that only applies in wartime. And it, you know, he'll make up some story. I mean, that would be more worthwhile. Let's go through not the Quran, not the Hadith. Let's go through the Sharia. Let's talk about all of that, and then ask and just watch him tap dance. I mean, that would be, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you know. Uh, I'm not saying 100% I would never do a debate, but it's just really, really low on my priority list because I, I think it's not a very good use of my time. I agree. Uh, so if we have no further questions, uh, we can go ahead and sign off. I'll give uh, my guests a chance to say a closing word. Uh, why don't you go first, Lloyd, and then we'll end with Aya since he presented today. Um, yeah, thanks guys for hanging out for, for two hours. We appreciate the questions, the, the really active engagement. Um, let us know how you find this useful, how you'll use it, what material like this you can use. Uh, I think between us, we have a lot of creativity and I learn a lot from you guys. I have a lot of material in my database like this, which I've prepared for many years. And I want to start doing more uh, work which defends Christianity and then starts to refute the lies instead of just attacking Islam which is always worth attacking. But, but yeah, let me know how you use this, um, what you need, and we'll start to prepare um, you know, videos and documents and other things that, that would be useful. Excellent. Uh, just to reiterate what I said earlier, you know, the content is freely licensed. You can take it and use it however you like. Uh, I would prefer you, you take it and use it. I will not be mad if you, you take it. You know, I won't be filing any copyright claims or anything like that. So definitely take the material and use it. Uh, to repeat announcement I made towards the beginning, I'll have a new scripted video out tomorrow looking at the uh, rising apostasy situation in Iran, how half the country potentially has already left Islam and has even much, much smaller numbers than half support basic tenets of the Islamic state in that country. Uh, I'm getting back into recording, so I'll be having some scripted videos coming up. For uh, I haven't, I, you know, I've only released like one or two in the, the last several months, but I'll be releasing more coming up. Uh, this Saturday, Lloyd and I will be on Sneakers Corner to talk about the Sharia law, kind of an introduction to what it is and its origins. 
we'll be looking at how it ties in with the stuff that Sneakers normally talks about, the historical origins of Islam and how it lends support to his uh, new theory that uh, Islam did not arise in uh, Mecca or Medina or Arabia or even in Petra, but rather in what is now known as uh, Iraq. Uh, so I'll give the final word to Ayo to close this out, kind of uh, summarize what we talked about today. Awesome, yeah. Um, so yeah, once again, just I really thank you guys for having me. This is a very important topic. Um, obviously one that has, it, it, it can, can be very simple, but also can be very deep as well, depending on how, how far one wants to go. And so I'm thankful that, you know, I was invited on and offered to give a presentation today. And, um, you know, regardless of my charisma or any of that, as Thaddeus was saying, I'm, I'm just hoping that you guys really uh, will take the information and, and that you'll use it. You know, um, we have a habit of, of, of just fattening ourselves with these live streams and all this information, but just think about how powerful, you know, and how influential we could be if we could truly just take this and apply it just as Paul did to situations and to others by sharing it with them. And so uh, definitely pray that, you know, the, that it just gets used and, you know, that any Muslims or even atheists watching, you know, will consider what we've said. Um, yeah. And I just want to thank you guys so much. Just be sure to, you know, if you haven't already subscribe to Thaddeus' channel, you know, hit the like button and same thing with Lloyd as well, get him to a thousand, you know, because they're doing really great work. And so, um, you guys are going to want to be in tune for that because it's going to be a good next few months. And so thank you guys so much and uh, just pray you have a good rest of your week. Thank you so much. God bless everyone.